right. Well, welcome to another Consults Over Coffee. I'm Dr. Michael Jones, and I am joined tonight by Mark Setcha, who is who teaches at Cuyacuson Middle School. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about what 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 do you teach there? Who who what grade? What levels? Oh, well, name it. I've actually taught all the grades there: sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, I've taught mostly science there. I've taught a little bit of history, uh, and uh, I think I've been kind of the uh, the plug in because I have certification in basically anything they need me to teach. So I float around a little bit. Uh, before that, I was at uh, Pinchbeck Elementary School teaching fourth and fifth grade for uh, about 17 years. So this is wow. my fifth year at Cuyacuson. So yeah, it's been. You've been at this a long time. Yes, I have. I've. It, it's crazy to think about it, but it's um, because it really isn't one of those jobs that you feel like you've been doing it this long. Because as you can tell, every day and every year brings a different thing. You know, we're constantly being told we need to, you know, relearn our jobs, and we're constantly being recertified and retaught and retrained. Um, but at the heart of that, I think is just being there for kids and setting good example for them. So a lot of this other stuff that we're taught a lot to yeah. do, uh, you know, bells and whistles, a lot of that obviously went out the window <laughs> uh, last year. <laughs> but, um, I think the main thing about doing what you do, what I do um, is that you can strip away a lot of the things that make, you know, uh, uh, you know, an exciting, you know, lights and bells and whistles but at the end of the day you've got to be able to be able to look in a kid's eyes and try to get to the heart of what they need yeah well and so and that's i mean that's a really that's exactly what i kind of how are you able to do that in the middle of all of this how's that going i mean obviously all bets are off in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Well, I mean, when this all happened last year, uh, there wasn't a teacher in the, uh, in the world that wasn't just, you know, called themselves into question about what what is this going to be like? What are we going to do? And of course, when we did it, we we're doing it last year, it was, a lot of it was just emergency Band-Aid type of things. And, you know, just try to get as much as we could uh, in terms of content in. And, and, and the other thing, though, was to try to check on kids and try to check on their family situation. Yeah. A lot of that fell to administrators and counselors and things like that. But I mean, to be honest, we really weren't, you know, teaching the way uh, we're not doing it now, but we really weren't teaching the way that, you know, we were trained to teach. It was more like, let's get out there and see who we can find and check on and, uh, you know, just make sure they're okay. The families are okay. And, you know, we're still kind of doing that. I think there's a lot of that in what we're doing now in terms of just the way we're approaching uh, academics. I think before all this, schools started to realize uh, character and, you know, communication and being able to be a good citizen and carry on a conversation with another student without wanting to, you know, tear them apart, you know, that they started, to, it started to dawn on them that these things may be important and not, you know, knowing you know, the name of the scientists who discovered DNA was as important. But um, I think there's going to be more of that in terms of the character education, because first of all, it, it needs to happen. I yeah. think what you're talking about in the future is, you know, if we're all going to be, uh, on devices like we are now, we should be able to have civil conversations and not use screens and windows as a way to, you know, uh, excuse ourselves from being civil and cordial and friendly and respectful. Social media has become a lot like a lot like people in automobiles. It 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 it's suddenly you're you're immune from repercussions of your behavior. Yeah, but That's you can make a different name for yourself. You can have an alias. You can have multiple accounts. I mean, we had a lot of students that were very creative with their uh, accounts and were making up people and stories about these people and families about these people. It was really, really weird stuff. I mean, some of it bordered on, you know, like... Pathology? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I think there was an episode where we had a student that was, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, trying to become friends with with another student. And because they were not getting any headway as themselves, they made themselves up to be somebody else. But then when things got a little strange, uh, I think the girl like killed off this alias of hers. And of course that set off a chain reaction where the girl who thought she knew this other girl oh, wow. who had supposedly, you know, killed herself or something happened to her. They, they, family investigated and all of this came out that it was just a big scam but it was one of those things where you go wow that's very manipulative and very almost like surreal well, and i think that's the thing i think and, and it's probably true for adults as well i mean social media at least for for me i mean this is a relatively new phenomenon right i mean right i mean as it, it is you know i think that we have always, I guess, looked to be entertained, of course, but I think when we entertain ourselves by the uh, the goings on of others, you know, where they're, what they're visiting, what food they're eating, you know, I, I think it becomes, we're all critics and we're all experts in things and we're all, you know, like Yelp, people give restaurants, you know, bad you know, bad reviews because they had lousy service one time, you know, food could oh, be great, yeah. but if you had a horrible experience that, you know, that might sink a restaurant for the, for no good reason, except that restaurant didn't have a very good night with service or they were backed up in the kitchen or whatever. So we don't really get right. to the, someone, someone perceived a perceived slight. Yes. But we can all be experts though. You can now be the person who knows the most about, Han Solo and, you know, get on a, a website and just spew endless, mindless gobbledygook about it. And people will listen to you and people will make their own opinions and have arguments with you. And this is what the, this is what people want to do. They want to stir the pot. And that's it's, in it's a fun. way making everything else more complicated. <laughs> no, it's, it's true. It's funny because, you know, a couple of years ago, I used to like to really kind of peruse comments on topical issues just to kind of see what people were thinking. And I got to the point where it's just like, I don't want to know anymore. Yeah, I don't want to go there. As a matter of fact, I really don't. You, just, you press enter, you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> right. and, 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 you know, it's like, you know what? I, I don't want to get my news. Don't get your news from Facebook. Don't oh, get no. your news from Instagram. Well, it's news in the sense that it's news about people. It's news about what, you know, what where somebody's going on vacation. Like, look at these beautiful pictures of Santorini, Greece. And yeah. so that's news. You've never been there. You want to see pictures of it. That's wonderful. You want to be on a, a group that's excited about their next trip to Hawaii or something like that. That's fine. But when we become, well, you know, why are you... You know, you're you're showing off your wealth by taking pictures. Don't you have anything better to do? And here we go. You know, that people that exist just for that, right? They're out there. Um, they're the reason I think that we have a tougher time at school teaching kids how to be civil and citizens and uh, good communicators and and respectful communicators <laughs> because it's easy to not be. They, because they see that, that that kind of behavior is modeled for them. Yeah, I mean, it's adults are doing it. Right, you know, right. It's like driving in a car with your young kid and you're turning around and someone cuts you off, you flip them off. You don't think your child's going to do that in 15, 20 years? Of course they are. He's going to do it less than that. <laughs> right, yeah. He may do it all the oh. way home. Yeah, I'm, so I'm sure they're saying in their mind, well, when I get to be that age, I'm not going to do what daddy's doing. <laughs> Not to say I'm guilty of that, but let's let's move on, shall we? <laughs> no, right, right. No, I mean that, and I think that's the thing is that it it really has it. it it's sort of it, it's social media in many ways has become weaponized. I mean, it's a double edged sword. I think you're right when you say it's the new car. It's the new place to be I, isolated and become like a superhero or supervillain. I, I did. I, I had a my son's godfather um, always used to say it was interesting. He, he, he was like the automobile is, is is a socially isolating tool, and and I'd be like, but but it connects us all. He goes, 
it'll get you from point A to point B. If you want to drive over and see your family, that's fine. Just, but you put somebody in an automobile and, and their behavior doesn't matter. And everyone around them is just another player in a, in a giant video game. Uh, yeah, I think you know, that's, and, and, a lot of that's true. It's a cocoon, but it's like a cocoon with like nails on the inside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But, you know, and that, but I remember that Marquis de when they closed that thing with the, you know, right, the, right, right, the medieval. Yeah. Right. I should yeah. know it's the Iron Maiden, but you know, it's that's that's what it's like. You get in your car, and then all of a sudden, you're you're surrounded by teeth, <laughs> and you want to like project that out to the to the world. You're either cutting people off, or you're sending them, you know, the finger, or whatever. I mean, it's just one of those things where it it liberates in the wrong way. I, I have to tell you, I mean, I, I remember, I mean, years ago, and, and it still happened, you know, we used to, you would, someone would be trying to merge or change lanes and you would flash your lights that they could come over, you know, and they would slide over and they would blink their lights and wave like, thanks for letting me in and you'd wave back and it like, and, and it doesn't, ha- it, I, it, it happened to me once a couple months ago. Some guy was trying to, and I'm like, eh, come in. And he was like, our age, so I guess he kind of knew the drill. And that interaction, I was like, that felt good. That felt yeah, nice. Because it was so unique and special. Yeah, but it was, you know, it's just, it was like a simple act of kindness. It's like holding the door for somebody. Yeah, it, it, I think, you know, I'm from New York City, and we get a bad reputation where, you know, we're, crass we're not kind i mean but i think part of the thing that new yorkers do is they try to help people that are in distress in the city that look like they're lost or look like they don't know what what's happening um yeah and it's not out of you know pity but you know you want you know this is an overwhelming experience for people and some people are just plain darn lost And, and this was back in the day probably when you didn't have a GPS in your hand, but I used to give people directions all the time or walk them someplace. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and being a New Yorker, I think that I wasn't trying to like prove people were wrong about New York, but no, we don't like pass by our neighbors and go, yeah, hi neighbor and keep, you know, keep walking. There's almost a, an air of understanding that if you're, if you live in New York, you're going to not want to be that kind of like suburban or country how's it going kind of person but you're still helpful and you're still there right. to, I mean, there's so many people around that you can't not get involved if someone like falls to the ground or something happens. I mean, it's just, it's so common with so many yeah, people I, around that you just feel like you have to help. I lived in, I lived in Chicago for 13 years and, and lived right in the city. And, and it was a similar kind of thing. Chicago is still kind of a, a more of a Midwest town in many ways. But I think when you get into places where there's a lot of population density, people don't interact as freely, but they will interact when they should, Mm -hmm. right? Like if some guy trips and falls down, people are going to go over and make sure he's okay for the Mm -hmm. most part. (laughs) Even like doing business with somebody, going to a store, you know, uh, it never to me, you know, people, I think just, assume things about city folk (laughs) and you know it's it's not always a fair assessment or assumption because i i think what city people have had in their lives is just people and i think that for those people especially i mean i can't even imagine what i would be doing with myself if i was living in new york and having to deal with this and having that kind of shift from having you know, the world kind of spilled out in the street when I walked out of the house to nobody's out, you know, it would have been a very strange thing for me. And it probably would have, I think, been a little bit more disturbing, you know, in terms of my psyche. It was was like, I, you know, you're used to a rhythm, you're used to a sound, you're used to a a pace. Right. And to take that away from New Yorkers is almost like stealing their soul. <laughs> it's like, uh, what am I going to do if I can't like get into an argument with somebody or, you know, hail well, a cab and hear the honking horns and this, wow, it's, it's strange. And not a lot of people are saying it's better. If you notice that, if you, if you're listening to New Yorkers, they want that back. They want it back. They want that pace back. They want that energy back. They want that uh, ability to like, 
you know, complain about something else besides the pandemic back. <laughs> no, I, right, exactly. So, so let me, well, let me ask you this. I mean, so how you mentioned before kind of checking up on kids and that, I mean, how are, how are, how are your students in, in all of this? I mean, obviously they probably want it all back as well, or are kids are pretty, Resi- you, I think you use the word resilient, but they are pretty malleable too. I mean, yeah, and I think that when it comes down to having to learn a new trick or having to kind of adjust to something, they're much better at it than adults are. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that we don't give them that opportunity because we're too busy thinking about how it's affecting us. We can't, you know. Oh well, I can't. Yeah, you know, with my kids here, I can't do my job, or I can, you know, and I get that, and I understand people who have to not work from home, and childcare is expensive, and it's a, it's it's frustrating. But kids can do this, you know. For the, mo- I mean, there's a there's an exception, but there's an exception when you're at school. The kids can't do that either, right? You know, kids can't be behaviorally sound in a group of of other kids. I mean, that's it's kind of like the same percentage is having trouble with this, but we're, oh, everybody's having a mental health thing is all you hear. It doesn't matter, liberal, conservative, all the stations are saying this. And teenage suicide was there before COVID and depression was there before COVID and anxiety was there before COVID. So I don't know where people are getting this idea that this is making something terrible out, you know, because of, of this. I mean, there's a lot terrible going on without that. And we have to be more responsive to that. I mean, obviously we train to see signs of depression and to see things in kids that would give us warning signs that there's trouble, but you know, as well as I do that, you know, teenage suicides and, and teenage anxiety and teenage depression, I mean, it's all, people don't remember. That's all we used to hear about going into the 2010s, you know, we have to stop this. They were almost calling it a a pandemic of uh, this feeling of kids being isolated and feeling alone. And, and, and it was a full school. It was, you know, there was 500 to a thousand kids in the school. And if you, if you're feeling isolated among hundreds of people, sure, you're going to feel isolated at home also, but for some kids, I'm not saying it's going to be a relief for them, but they're thriving in this because they're able to concentrate and focus and be better without worrying about what people think of them or people are judging their clothing or how the, their hair looks or something like that. Yeah. I'm more for older kids than for younger kids, but it's really weird. Sixth grade to me, and I've taught six, seven, eight. sixth grade to me is still elementary in their mindset. Okay. Because they're still, they still enjoy school as a rule. They're still excited about going. They're still, you know, jazzed about the activities and the things they do. They've, and then something happens, you know, seventh and eighth grade there, there's a lot, there's a lot more of that drama. There's a lot more of that emotional uh, attachment that they get to not only other people, but just to how they're perceived. It's emotional to them to think that other people are judging them. It is, and, is, is there, is, does a lot of that have to do with, with your sort of, that's sort of the age at which you start to see adolescents beginning yes. that there's a lot of change. Yes. And they're warned. I mean, they, they, you know, we say, you know, they take family life. They know there's, Things are going on and things are going to change and, uh, you know, your voice is going to change this and that. But there's still plenty of kids that are just not prepared or they're not able to handle it or they're just uh, feel like they are square pegs trying to fit in around holes. We have to be better at that than at being able to have them pass an SOL test. We have to be better at the heart and the soul and make, and make sure that's as important as the mind. And yes, we, we were discussing uh, in, in Henrico County, uh, you know, character uh, lessons and 
you know, and um, learn, you know, just the deeper learning as they call it. But a lot of it is to hell with these numbers and facts and figures. Okay. Let's yeah. get to the root of the person, because if you're going to be someone who's, you know, a genius, but you can't carry on a conversation with the person in the next, in the next room, they're not going to want to hire you. You know, the, the, the smarts will come. What needs to come now is the understanding that you have to, you may not be best friends with the people you're in, in the classroom with, but you have to respect all of them. And you have to respect the fact that they are there and their opinion and their existence matters and should matter equally to you as you. And if you don't have that in your mind yet, that's something that not only teachers have to work on, but also, you know, counselors and parents and every in 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 you know in conjunction with each other, not separate. But I think that there's too much sometimes of the parents saying, God, that's not my my child doesn't do that. Of course they don't, because they're different at school because they're surrounded by a thousand kids. And yeah. they are going to be different. You know, we can't stick a you know a webcam on them and show you how they're different, but you have to understand when we say School uh, can things are not the same at school because of the fact that you know your child is you know potentially not gelling well with the idea of themselves and how they communicate with other other kids, and that's not something that's unteachable, right? But we've ignored it. You know, we just expect kids to come in and be behaved and be respectful and be you know have a pencil in their hand and. You know, I, they didn't, they didn't have it 20 years ago. They certainly don't have them now, you know, and some of them need that help to get over that, that mindset and to get over that idea of it, awkwardness and help themselves through this period. I think middle school, especially, it's almost like they need to take a year off from academics and concentrate on the deeper learning, on the mindset, on the person, on the things that make them human. Because I think if they come out with that understanding that that's as important as everything else and they're as important as anything else or anyone else, that they are going to be able to handle things down the road better, I think. Those are those are excellent points. I just – it's interesting. It, it, we – I guess the old phrase was, was home training, Right. I mean, those were the things that, you know, that, that if you didn't say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, hold the door for that lady, you know, you kind of heard about it, you know, from your parents. And you know what, quite frankly, I don't expect us to go back to that. I mean, no, but, but, but I think there's been an erosion. It's a different era. It's a different yeah. century. I mean, but we can still look each other in the eye and you know, nod our heads and smile and do all the things that we should do when we are communicating, whether that's like this or face to face. It, that part doesn't matter to me. You know, you want to have a conversation with me, you can do it just as easily the way we're doing it. One that's, on one. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, and that's the thing about what people are saying about schools needing to be in person or you know a lot of people have chosen virtual for the rest of the year partly out of safety but par partly also because their kids are doing well with it you know i think the percentage is actually if, if you know if i were to to guess was actually maybe more like 60 percent virtual to 40 you know the, yeah. the schools are in full and the schools are in full because all the kids are clamoring to go back in um i think a lot of them are doing well with the circumstances because like we've talked about, they are, they are malleable. They are, they, they have a, a, an easier time of adjusting if they're given the chance and the encouragement to make those adjustments. Right. That this is an acceptable path forward. Yes. If we're all yeah. pulling our hair out, wondering what's going to happen in an hour. No, the, 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 kids that are around that are going to be as anxious and as uptight as the parents. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I think that's and yes, true. there's a lot of things that they miss. I, I mean, I have a senior in high school and it breaks my heart that he's not going to do the senior play. He's not going to, 
be hanging out with his friends in the lounge. I mean, th these are things that he's going to miss. We've come to the realization that these are times in his life he's not going to get back. But we talk about them. We don't say, well, you know, it'll be all right. It's not going to be all right. Sometimes you're going to need to say, you know, this sucks and I hate it and I, I want to talk about it. And we have to, as adults, encourage their feelings to be validated and to be something that uh, we we can not get into their skin and, and be them and understand it exactly, but we can sympathize with them. I mean, I'm not going out and buying my son a, you know, a, a Camaro because he's because he's missing a senior of high school. But we try to do things that are, you know, that, that kind of ease it up a little bit. No, yeah. and I think, well, and that gets another good point is that it, it's empathy. Yeah. Right. Which which is another another social commodity that I think could stand some enhancement. Right? I mean, or just good modeling. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. We, yeah, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Are there any other are there any other points or observations that you've made or, or that that you think we you would like folks to know about or parents to be aware of with respect to their children right now? Well, we want, nobody wants to be, and nobody wants to, to stay home and be isolated. You know, teachers live for the connections. We all do. Yeah. And I think that it, it does really affect us when people think that we are trying to not work. I've never worked harder in my life trying to do things that are dynamic. Uh, we've had to reteach ourselves and retrain ourselves how to do everything. You know, there's nothing the same about what we're doing now than what we did last year. Everything had to change. The way we deal with everything. I mean, imagine, you know, I can't even, my, my wife does this with first graders. Wow. I, I, you know, I... <laughs> I'm almost like in awe because I've seen her and you know what? She's working her tail off. She's making this work. And we still hear about how we're delaying something that should have been happening months ago. And trust me, um, it shouldn't have happened months ago because things are not right with <laughs> numbers. And I mean, I don't right. know why people don't listen to doctors and, and experts, but it just seems to be the trend now. We, we teach because we love teaching and we love kids and we want to be there for them wherever that is. However that is, we, we try to meet them there. And I will say that I've learned a lot this year and I've learned a lot about kids resilience and kids stamina. And, you know, I think that there's a future for some kids who really, when they homeschool to do things a little bit differently, do things better. And I'd love to be on a panel that kind of discusses how to integrate that homeschool experience with that in-school experience. I think we need to bridge that better because sometimes, you know, we are, we're not always understanding what isolation means and yeah. mental illness means. And, you know, we're not causing mental illness by having this like this. Okay. I think what we're doing is we're shifting things. And when we're back in school, we're going to hear the same things we heard before we before all this happened and sadly i don't know how much is going to be done about it because when it's in school or when it's you know something that doesn't affect everyone people tend to sweep it under the rug you know thoughts and prayers let's move on and that's not how it should be i i mean the saddest days i've ever had in my life was when i opened up the paper and saw one of my ex-students uh was no longer with us and you know it it breaks my heart because I remember them as kids with so much future and so much potential. And when I see that, you know, any kid that I've come into contact with, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost like it's my kid that, that's gone. Yeah. It's, and that's, it's personal and it's not going to stop when everybody's back and we're all cheering the first day that the schools are, are full. We're just going to fall back into this mindset and we can't anymore. We have to do better, making sure that even when we are back, we're addressing the most important things about our kids. Great. Well, we're, we're pretty much out of time, I, and that's a great place to stop. I just want to thank you first for doing this, but more importantly, 
for what you do and for how you do it. I, I appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. Well, Mark, thanks very much. Thank you. All right.